al mundo. Es el gen. ¿Se escucha? ¿Están por ahí? Buenos días. Vamos a iniciar la, el tercer día de este excelente curso, ¿no? la jornada celeriana de ultrasonido músculo esquelético. Y esta mañana del 25 de septiembre tenemos eh, tres interesantes charlas, ¿no? ya enfocadas más al área reumatológica. La primera vamos a empezar con ultrasonografía de la artritis reumatoide, compromiso temprano, índices articulares, luego diferenciación de la artritis reumatoide y psoriasis de la mano, tema muy importante, características ecográficas, evaluación de la gota y otras dolencias por cristales en, con el ultrasonido, ¿no? Entonces, son temas muy importantes que vamos a tener el agrado de escuchar nuevamente a un distinguido profesor como es el doctor Lijanikowski, que en los dos días previos nos ha dado lecciones muy importantes para la evaluación de las enfermedades articulares. Adelante, doctor Yuhani. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. And welcome. You. Welcome. Uh, this is the third and final day. And, and we have the first lecture. I will start now. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. The topic is ultrasound in rheumatoid arthritis. Early joint involvement joint index. Uh, ultrasound is very helpful for differentiating and for diagnosing regional pain and swelling in all uh, limb joints and, and anatomic areas. There are numerous studies to show that clinical examination alone is insufficient. We need, that's why we need uh, different uh, imaging modalities like ultrasound. We need also X-rays, MRI, CT, and so on. We need them all. Uh, with ultrasound, we have two most important uh, modes. P mode, it, it shows the image as gray scales, and with uh, uh, with gray with with P mode, we can in patient with uh, rheumatoid arthritis or suspicion we can see fluid. Fluid is uh, uh, black, uh, unechoic or hypoechoic tissue, which can be compressed if you compressed with your transducer. Then we have the synovial hypertrophy, which is more uh, uh, less unechoic. It's echogenic material. You can a little bit compress it and it really, oft, really often uh, shows so-called Doppler signal. So we have this Doppler mode, which shows the uh, vascularization uh, in synovium. And, and this, is, uh, this shows us uh, uh, the inflamed uh, uh, area. Uh, OMERACT is an uh, international uh, organization that has produced uh, several important uh, definitions uh, regarding the synovial, uh, regarding the ultrasonographic phenomenon. For example, what is effusion? It's abnormal, hypoechoic, or unechoic material that can, that can be dis, displaceable and compressible. Uh, so it does not exhibit uh, Doppler signal, as I just said in last slide. But now we have a new OMRAC definitions uh, uh, published recently, and for a, a very, uh, it's very, um, Strange that they they uh, they they don't like 
anymore the effusion uh, uh, definition. They say that um, the new definition lacks elementary lesion of synovial effusion because it did not prove reliable and was frequently detected in healthy subjects. This is a little bit uh, uh, strange because in practical life, we see uh, many pa patients, their, their only lesion is effusion and pro probably not um, uh, this. Uh, so I disagree with this. Uh, synovial effusion is important still. However, they also define uh, synovitis as presence of hypoechoic synovial hypertrophy. Regardless, the presence of effusion or any grade of Doppler signal. So Doppler can be a part of uh, synovitis, but uh, synovitis is defined also without Doppler. If you look at the ultrasound, which is US here, ultrasound in rheumatoid continuum, we have um, first almost healthy people or individuals who are at risk of uh, to have RA. For, 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 for example, patient with uh, positive autoantibodies, uh, CCP, um, uh, and they might have musculoskeletal symptoms, but uh, they, but we don't find any uh, clinical synovitis, so we cannot say with clinical um, that, that he or she has rheumatoid disease. Then we use uh, uh, ultrasound, trying to differentiate different diseases. For example, I'm going to talk about gout later. We, we try to um, differentiate uh, spondyloarthropathy from um, uh, rheumatoid disease and so. And of course, we need we use ultrasound in, in established disease for uh, uh, not only for diagnosing, but all, also to, to follow up the treatment results. Um, we, we use. We, as I will show you, we can use ultrasound for prognostic uh, uh, things and so on. And finally, um, we can use ultrasound uh, in remission. So it's very wide use in, in, uh, of ultrasound in, in Roma, uh, rheumatology and especially in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Let's have a look uh, first uh, what ultrasound shows in normal uh, people. Prevalence of ultrasound synovial inflammatory findings in healthy. There was a, uh, a large uh, study published. So they, uh, they examined dozens of healthy people, more than 6,000 joints, and about less than 10 percentage, less than 10 percentage had some abnormality. What, what was this abnormality? Usually there were mild effusion, mild effusion, for example, in MTP joint, which is, which is quite common in, in uh, middle-aged and elderly people. Synovial hypertrophy was uncommon and especially synovial hypertrophy with Doppler, that was very uncommon uh, finding. So um, we can say that uh, more than 90% uh, of, of normal healthy people doesn't exhibit any any inflammatory uh, signs of, uh, of, of in, in ultrasound. Uh, Doppler can predict uh, rheumatoid arthritis. There was a study by Jackie Nam. Nam. Um, there was 100, 
36 anti-CCP positive persons who were without clinical arthritis. They were followed 18 months. So we see that if the uh, patient, if they didn't, didn't have uh, Doppler, they did not develop uh, rheumatoid arthritis, clinical rheumatoid arthritis. But if they have had a, a lot of Doppler in their joints, they developed uh, clinical uh, uh, rheumatoid disease. Um, again, uh, Doppler helps in the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. For example, Jane Priestan uh, examined 50 seronegative patients with early arthritis. And when she used power Doppler with routine assessment, uh, it had a major impact on the certainty of diagnosis. In a second uh, study by Andrew Feiler, uh, Doppler scanning improved significantly the diagnosis in 58 patients. Uh, the gray boxes are clinically uh, uh, proven uh, synovitis, but as you see, these black boxes uh, was more sensitive, ultrasound produced more positive uh, synovial uh, findings. So Doppler helped in the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Again, one study that shows that ultrasound is helpful, Nakagomi at uh, Allied uh, examined more than 100 patients with musculoskeletal symptoms. And if they used only clinical uh, 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 data and, and palpation anamnesis, uh, they found a certain amount of uh, RA positive and negative RA, but if they took uh, a grayscale ultrasound, they, the, the diagnostic was much more sensitive. And together with Doppler findings, it raised the sensitivity of, of having positive diagnosis. So the ultrasound helps in the diagnosis of RA. And then, Doppler, Doppler predicts erosive progression. Uh, for example, like here in these uh, images, we have normal uh, three months, uh, 12, uh, two years, and so on. So you see that the erosion grows here uh, along with the time. Uh, Taylor showed that Doppler signal predicts MCP erosions, brown, Naredo have shown that high Doppler signal predicts erosive progression in future, and uh, Fouquet that Doppler reducing Doppler means better radiological pro prognosis. So, uh, uh, if you can reduce, so this is already treatment. I will talk about that later. Uh, now, this is only one case, one single joint depicted with Doppler. Uh, MTP4 in, in a naive RA patient, it was a man. Uh, month zero, MTP4, clearly positive uh, uh, with Doppler and uh, with a, a grayscale two. And then we, um, the eye uh, started oral therapy. And in one month, you see the Doppler is already gone. So Doppler is very sensitive uh, for uh, change. And, uh, but as you see, there is still grayscale changes. After three months, also grayscale, the, the uh, widening of the uh, joint space is diminished and, and uh, the good re treatment result remains for nine months at least. So this only shows that uh, in one patient, one single joint that we have uh, 
um, uh, uh, the use of, of ultrasound. And there are numerous studies to show that Doppler reacts the treatment. I'm not going to uh, uh, repeat this, but you see in, numer in all over uh, human joints, numerous uh, uh, studies showing that Doppler goes down with treatment. And one nice uh, uh, image showing that too, there was a uh, Norwegian study, so-called Arctic study, um, 2016, 238 patients, uh, and in the baseline, uh, almost everyone had Doppler signal. Red one is high Doppler signal, and so on. Green, green is uh, uh, no Doppler. So almost every patient had baseline Doppler, but then they gave good treatment. Uh, so you see that in one year. Doppler is negative in most of the patients, so you can you can use Doppler uh, like this. Um, then, if we can use Doppler also for predicting a new flare in when we we are in clinical remission, so we are clinical remission, but we, if we see Doppler, that means that the patient will have uh, in future uh, new attack of, of uh, uh, if, if power Doppler synovitis was found, increased risk of flare is here. And, and, but if the patient has even tenosynovitis, T means power Doppler tenosynovitis, it's even more increased risk of having disease flare. So power Doppler positivity in tendons and joints is an independent risk factor for flare in clinical uh, remission. Uh, I already uh, showed this just to uh, show you that ultrasound is very sensitive in, in detecting effusion in, in many joints, for example, in elbow joints. This is an old study in the 90s found even one millimeter of fluid can be detected in, in uh, elbow. Now I have some examples. Uh, here we have uh, MCP joint, clear uh, widening of the, ten, of the joint. There is proliferation with Doppler signal. We see here uh, synovitis and Tenosynovitis. So here is synovitis, intraarticular, and then we have on that uh, tenosynovitis as well. This is the grayscale image. You see here widening of the tenor sheet with uh, unequate material, uh, suggesting uh, synovitis, but if you put Doppler, it's clearly positive. Uh, just uh, the elbow synovitis, just an example is proliferation uh, inside the, uh, and do with Doppler signal. As you remember, the uh, posterior scanning method is probably the best, the most uh, is rapid uh, and very good to, to, to show uh, synovitis. And glenohumeral joint posterior scan uh, here, and uh, but usually we see only fluid here. But in this case, you see clear proliferation, widening of the uh, joint space with proliferative changes with and Doppler signals, confirming chronic uh, situation. Actually, this was a, a lady who didn't want to use any medication. And but uh, so he served as a nice image. Uh, how, how does it look uh, shoulder when you don't want to have medication? OK, biceps tendinitis uh, here. We already saw that. 
and these nasty uh, willows uh, hypertrophy in, in knee joint. Black is fluid. Uh, all this is uh, corresponding to the uh, uh, arthroscopic view. Uh, is uh, willows synovitis with Doppler signal in the supra patellar area. Posterior subtalar joint synovitis. There is uh, bulging of uh, echogenic uh, material out of, of the joint. The joint is here. And uh, with, with great scale, you can suspect oh, this is uh, synovitis. And if you put the, if you put the and Doppler mode on, you can clearly see that this is synovitis. Talonavicular synovitis depicted like in, in the upper uh, panel. And this MTP joint, we already saw that. So, but everything is not so easy as it <laughs> looks like. We have a reliability problem in ultrasound. Okay, it's the same in all imaging methods. Somehow, uh, scanning examination. You can train. Uh, uh, you can train and train and train again, but still, there are thirty percent its error when you make uh, ultrasound, when two people are making ultrasound, there's always error. So it's it's not easy. We have two dimensional image, but uh, there's still uh, problems of getting the same results. Acquisition of the image, you have to know the anatomy technique, you have used the right window. Uh, don't compress, I will show it later, don't compress. Uh, uh, with your transducer too much, you don't see in that case uh, Doppler. And finally, the interpretation of findings is this normal or pathologically? It's it's sometimes uh, but the same. This is the same in all radiological uh, investigations. Is this normal or pathological? Oh, it's it's a, this is a common problem. Uh, pitfalls uh, using grayscale. So I hope we, you and me, me will have good quality machines. If you have a low quality, the image is always uh, worse. And then choose right frequency of P mode, uh, uh, good transducer, and uh, use good depth and focus and gain. So you have to adjust the, the machine in a, in a proper way. For example, if you if you are uh, using gain and regulate it, as you see here, it seems that this is uh, in the PIP joint, there is um, proliferation. And if you put more, uh, uh, sorry, less gain, Finally, you, you only see uh, unechoic. It seems that there is only fluid. So the interpretation here in this image, you see uh, unechoic fluid, but in this image, you see uh, more or less synovitis. So it's a, uh, and here uh, again, I have in, uh, aspirated typical rheumatoid inflammatory fluid. And if you see, uh, this with gain 65 in this machine, you put more gain, you see it less uh, unechoic. So uh, the problem of gain, even how, how much you put gain, it shows a little bit different results. And again, this anisotropy. If you, you this uh, in the left panel, you have exactly uh, perpendicular to the tendon. But here you have tilted the transducer just to one, two, three degrees. 
Uh, so you see uh, 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 something here. Follow, uh, so hollow, hollow. Uh, it seems, but uh, you have to be careful with uh, an isotropy. And then we have the Doppler. Doppler is very uh, uh, tricky uh, because there are many many points you can you can uh, which can go wrong. Uh, first, you have to choose Doppler or color Doppler, and it's in the it's dependent on machine. Uh, Tor Pedersen and also I have done uh, research that shows that different machines have different uh, sensitivity Doppler. Some machines might have a good uh, color Doppler. Some machines might have good power Doppler. So uh, the only thing you can uh, examine that is that you have a good uh, inflamed joint and then uh, adjust your machine and look which is more sensitive and and use power doppler if, if that's better than power than color doppler so uh, doppler frequency doppler frequency is different than uh, p mode frequency you have to uh, uh, look which is the best in each joint this is very important Bulse repetition frequency Pulse repetition frequency. You have to put it lowest possible. This lowest mean that usually we cannot go much lower than 500 hertz because the shaking of the examiner's hand will ruin the, it makes too much noise. This is very important. And, and then color priority, many, many uh, machines automatically put all color, all priority color. Wall filter uh, means that uh, if we are examining large vessels like our, uh, Arta or, or, or Carotis communis, you have to put high uh, wall filter because uh, there is so much motion artifact from the from the uh, vessel wall, but uh, in uh, when we are depicting slow flow, we we put very uh, low filter. We want to actually see this movement. It makes it more sensitive. Color persistence. How for how long the color stays there? Well, this is not the uh, obligatory uh, point. But the gain, this means color gain, it's very important on the, on the threshold to noise. So, and focus, uh, very many uh, machines automatically put uh, the focus where you put the uh, box, the color box. Uh, if, if you remember only two, two things, uh, it's good, the PRF about 500 and gain, color gain on the threshold to noise. So uh, raise the color gain and when there is noise, put it down. So these two uh, uh, functions are uh, important. So there are many, many uh, things uh, that can go wrong using Doppler. Excellent article of the Doppler settings is in uh, Annals of Rheumatoid Disease 2008. It's a classic, classic paper by Tor Pedersen and Lene Tersle. They are the, the king and queen of Doppler. Okay, and don't forget um, normal feeding vessels when depicting uh, everything Doppler, uh, what you see is not pathological. There are feeding vessels in uh, joints going into the tendon joints and uh, tendon. So uh, if there is one solitary uh, vessel, it can be feeding, normal feeding vessel. And all Doppler is not pathological. Healing, fracture, we, we need Doppler for repair. So it's a uh, corrective. 
um, uh, flow. It has to be, there must be hyperemia to, to repair this uh, fracture. This is not inflammation, it's, it's a normal healing process. As I said, uh, we studied um, 50 years ago uh, the sensitivity of different machines for slow flow uh, with the method that we used pump and we had here uh, uh, blood mimicking fluid. They are plastic particles, they mimic fluid, they have the same properties for ultrasound and, and then, then it goes to a plas through plastic tube, one millimeter uh, tube uh, through the uh, artificial tissue, which has its so-called um, hydro, hydro uh, well, I don't remember now what is, it, it, it's difficult to make. Uh, polyvinyl alcohol dehydrogen, the, that was the drug. Uh, it has the same uh, speed of sound than normal tissue, 1,540. Okay, so we, with this uh, experiment, I showed that uh, device one and device two was superior. They, had, they could depict the slowest flow, uh, uh, like normal capillary flow. But as you see, there are many machines that are not so effective. For example, device eight, uh, seven, eight, and nine, they, they are very bad. They, they cannot detect uh, slow flow at all. And pay attention that in some machines, another probe, for example, device two, probe one, device two, another probe, produces different uh, uh, sensitivity uh, figures than the, the, uh, another probe. So the machines differ uh, showing uh, slow flow. And then when you're depicting uh, Doppler, you have to remember that you have a proper image acquisition. For example, in this case, if you depict here, you don't see anything, but the Doppler could be, in this case, be detected on the lateral of the joint. So always move a little bit uh, uh, from side to side to, to not just to depict one point, but you have to a little bit change the, uh, to, to try to find a uh, sign of itis. And don't don't press with the probe. Uh, I'm uh, now I'm compressing with my probe. You see, don't Doppler, and after that, uh, you see the flow. So never uh, push hard. Use only a lot of gel and very gentle compression. Never compress. Uh, we have some problematic joints in Doppler imaging, like hip joint, very seldom you see Dopplers. Also in glenohumeral joint, relatively seldom. Elbow, the best site is dorsal, as I have said. Upper ankle joint, quite seldom you found Doppler uh, in upper ankle joint, tibial tail joint. And if you pay attention, it, you, you very often find Doppler lateral of the joint. The synovitis for a reason or another uh, accumulates on the lateral side of the joint. And, and we can ask where to, to score in knee joint. Okay, this is just to remind you to uh, how to see uh, synovium. Uh, it is an old uh, observation. So some words about histology. Here we see the histology of uh, inflamed joint. About 10 layers thick uh, or is, the, is the synovial lining. So this white side here is the joint uh, space. Synovial lining, there is hyperplasia. And then we have a sublining layer, stroma. 
with a lot of uh, inflammatory black cells. And here are the uh, vessels. This is the Doppler uh, uh, when, when, when you depict the synovium, you see these vessels. Uh, there are some uh, papers examining the uh, Doppler versus histology, histological score. Uh, some uh, animal works and then human works, uh, probably Andersen's work is the best. They found positive correlation of histology, uh, histological score and Doppler score. We make a similar study earlier. We, we didn't find uh, statistical uh, significance, but the trend was like uh, in uh, Andersen's study. Uh, uh. And then we, we some words are scoring synovitis. Um, why should we score a joint or patient? Because uh, we have to uh, score um, in practical work because there are other colleagues than we who who we 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 have to be somehow. Uh, aware, uh, we have to tell uh, and document what is the amount of Doppler in each uh, patient. Of course, scientific work needs Doppler. Usually, grayscale scoring is zero to three. Zero is normal. Three is uh, uh, a lot of Doppler at the same. Zero to three. We have now combined Euler score, I will tell you later. Then we have the second level, patient level. So we put all these uh, joints together. That, that's, that's more for scientific work. It is, um, I think, uh, 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 this is um, Euler Omerak is not easy. Um, but just with uh, some word, grade zero, uh, grade scale is normal. No Doppler, uh, sorry, no uh, synovitis, no uh, grade scale uh, thickening. Grade one, minimal, minimal hypoechoic synovial hypertrophy. Then moderate, uh, it's a little bit more ex extending beyond joint line. But uh, with the upper surface concave, and then we have the severe case. So it's uh, convex. This uh, uh, so much synovitis that it goes clearly over the joint line. So from zero to three, and then Doppler score uh, zero, nothing. Here is synovitis with grayscale, but no Doppler. And here is uh, ob obviously no uh, grayscale changes, but there is Doppler. So up to three single Doppler spots is grade one, or one confluence spot. It is a uh, bigger. Uh, then grade two is more than one, but less than 50% of the joint space here. Doppler is less than 50%. And then grade three is more than 50%. So in this case, almost 100% of the joint is filled with Doppler. So it's, it's, a, it's a three. And now I have to make you confused. <laughs> there is omerak euler combined synovial score, which, is, which means that um, these two grayscale and Doppler is put together. But this, is, this uh, seems uh, difficult, but actually it is not. Uh, you see, you just take the highest number of, uh, uh, of uh, Doppler or grayscale. For example, if you have a grade three, you might have synovial hypertrophy at grade three, or less than grade three power Doppler. So power Doppler can be zero, but the highest number is grade three synovial hypertrophy, it's grade three. Or you can have 
uh, one uh, grade one synovial hypertrophy and grade three th three uh, uh, power Doppler signal. So you take the highest of uh, Doppler or uh, this is the combined. Uh, they have examined the reliability with the patient and they have found relatively good kappa coefficient in priest PRP, knee and MTP using uh, this reliability, uh, this uh, scoring and, uh, and Doppler uh, and combined scoring goes like this. So we remember that about 0 0.5 or 6 is good. So they are relatively good reliability uh, when you, when you uh, examine patients. But once again, I disagree. Uh, this is my personal opinion. Why they don't take effusion? They say that effusion does not reflect synovial activity and is less responsive to treatment. Therefore, joint effusion was not included uh, in OMP. But uh, in practical life, we see a lot of effusion and not uh, hypertrophy. But so it must have some, some meaning is effusion two. Now we, we go to the uh, patient level. We talked uh, in last slide, joint, single joints, but now if we put this together, uh, there are many competing uh, schools, 12 joints, 44 joints, seven joints. So how many joints you take into account when you may make a score and they are competing with each other. I skip this because I think this is not good in <coughs> practical life. This is more for uh, science. <coughs> Here is just an example how this uh, overall Sinovity score goes. In one study, they had a, a lot of patients they gave uh, uh, biologic treatment. So effusion goes like this, uh, synovial hypertrophic and Doppler and this uh, scoring, combined scoring goes like this. If you take a 22 pair joint set, it goes like this down uh, along with the treatment, nine joints goes like this. And so does 27 with CRP goes also down. So um, this is uh, uh, just to, to uh, in scientific work, you can use this uh, kind of. Uh... So we are happy to have the last slide to summarize. Ultrasound synovitis is, is sensitive and is more sensitive than clinical evaluation and has many implications for diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up. Yeah. And B-mode and Doppler is very important in rheumatologic, uh, in, are in uh, very, uh, in rheumatologic ultrasound, yes. Ultrasound synovitis has pitfalls. You have to take into account, into account this, uh, and it, that can lead to under, recognition or over -interpre interpretation in some cases. So, but uh, to, to conclude, I would like to say that uh, ultrasound is much more efficient than if, I, if I'm working without it. <laughs> that's the, that's the uh, final word, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Johan. Excellent course, excellent lectures in the morning. Thank you. Jesús, hacemos un, un, un break o continuamos? Eh, un break, creo. Sí, Perfecto. un break. 15 minutos. 15 minutos igual, ya. Sí. Entonces, descansamos okay. 15 minutos y retornamos con la siguiente conferencia. Gracias. Perfecto, gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. de la mano reumática y de la artritis psoriática.
Island Director. Yeah. Okay, I, I changed the presentation here. Okay. Um, like that. Um, that. And uh, wait, the sharing. They don't. Do they hear? Do you hear me? No, no se ve, no se ve la pantalla. Yeah. Do they? Uh, wait. Se escucha, se escucha bien, pero no se ve la pantalla. That. Yes, and this, and then. Okay, excellent. Thanks. Okay. Now you see the first slide, differentiation between psoriasis, right? Right? Se, se ve bien. Se ve, se ve sí. y se escucha perfectamente. Okay. Okay. Perfecto. Okay. So differentiation between psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, of, of course, I'm going to talk about that, but because we have a good time, so I, I talk I, about ultrasound of the hand uh, also, so to cover the, 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 also this joint area, because this is the, the only joint area we have not discussed about all other shoulder, elbow, hip, knee, and ankle foot. So I'm also talking about hand. Uh, if we uh, look at the psoriatic arthritis, which is P PSR, uh, there is uh, characteristics like synovitis, tenosynovitis, erosion are like in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, of course, with ultrasound, we don't see bone edema, but this is uh, for MRI. Uh, but then what is different from uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, enthesitis? We have uh, talked about that already. Then very patho pathognomonic uh, for psoriatic arthritis is ductulitis. Uh, uh, it's for uh, spondyl arthropathy. Uh, if, if you see this kind of ductulitis, it's... Uh, um uh, the patient uh, likely to have psoriatic arthritis then we see more soft tissue edema uh, and of course sacroiliitis is typical for for uh, psoriatic arthritis but uh, we are not talking about that uh, because we are not able to see it with ultrasound so um, as I said, no differences between uh, arthritis. Uh, these both could be uh, uh, psoriatic arthritis or in, in uh, uh, for example, this is in wrist joint or tenosynovitis are equal. But the joint distribution in psoriasis is different. As we know, the joint distribution is more the DIP joint, distal in the phalangeal joints in psoriatic arthritis. Uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, the PIP and MCPs. And the enthesitis, we have already spoken about enthesitis and once again, what is enthesitis? It's an insertion of tendons, ligaments, a capsule to bone. And there are numerous sites of enthesis in human body. And uh, this is very typical for spondylarthropathy and uh, uh, most frequently found in lower limbs, but also, also you can find it in, in uh, uh, elsewhere in the body. We have already talked about plantaris fasciitis, 
Achilles tendon insertion, uh, quadriceps and patellar, and so on, greater trochanter. And ultrasound is more sensitive than clinical examination. Um, uh, the diagnostic value of ultrasound, there is uh, one concise report, Martin, Marvin Gutierrez, Filippucci and so on, they examine, examined uh, differential diagnosis between rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. And what they found at the MCP, metacarpophalangian level, they found that in psoriasis, there is peritendon extensor inflammation uh, found. And, and this, is, this is one uh, typical uh, that differs from uh, rheumatoid. It is shown here uh, on the right panel, but first, this is the, uh, it says here, synovial pattern. So the inflammation is entirely in the joint. Doppler signals are in the joint. But in psoriatic arthritis, you can see some Doppler signals in the joint, but what is uh, obvious that there is uh, around this extensor tendon, there is inflammation. Grayscale changes, fluid and edema and Doppler signal. So this peritendon uh, uh, inflammation is quite an, uh, uh, typical for psoriasis and not for rheumatoid. And now we have this sausage finger here, sausage finger, and duct, uh, also called ductulitis. This is typical for spondyloarthropathy and psoriatic arthritis. This is not seen in, in rheumatoid arthritis. What is this? This is a, it's a comp combination. There is tenosynovitis, as you see here, fluid around the tendon and Doppler signal, but there is also soft tissue edema here, subcut subcutaneously, and there is also uh, uh, periostitis, but that is not what we see in but we see we see synovitis, tendinitis, peri uh, soft tissue edema <clears throat> with ultrasound. Behind this um, sausage finger, that is typical for psoriasis. Now I uh, talk to you about ultrasound of the hand. In overall, we have this. Basic standard scans in long axis wrist horizontal on the volar, volar wrist horizontal in long axis. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, finger joint, uh, we have MCP area in long axis, short axis, fingers, tendons, uh, volar uh, joints here, long axis, and transverse. Then we have some special uh, views like to examine erosion of the MCP2, or for example, uh, to examine the flexor uh, policies. And again, there are a good guide, scanning guide for wrist and hand too in uh, Euler website. If you want to examine and study uh, normal joints. How should we depict synovitis of the wrist? The transducer is placed dorsally uh, first. Then you can scan radial side and ulnar side, moving the transducer. But if you are in the middle of the, uh, 
on the on the third finger level so you see capitatum capitatum is in the third finger level when the transducer is in long axis in case of uh sinovitis you see this um, this kind of uh, protrusion of, of sinovial hypertrophy uh, seen here here also in cartoon then we have the mid carpal joint this is radiocarpal mid carpal joint sometimes you also see carpometacarpal joint this is a joint i have never seen any publications uh, of this uh, it's a but you you quite often see also inflammation at this area usually we only talk about when we were talking about wrist inflammation we, we talk about wrist joint inflammation we talk about radiocarpal midcarpal uh, just a uh, example of uh, radion midcarpal joint synovitis depicted with doppler and yeah then we have the distal radio ulnar joint you put the probe on the uh, ulna if there is no fluid you see this kind of uh, image with a very old machine but uh, anyway you see the point here is some fluid a little bit more fluid and with the newer machines you see widening on the of the joint space with Doppler signal here. Yeah. The transducer is on the uh, distal ulnar head. MC, CMC1 is uh, very often found in uh, osteoarthritis. If you place the transducer dorsally, you can go around this joint if you want to, to, to try to find synovitis and uh, uh, or uh, osteophytes. CMC1, ultrasound is very helpful in uh, examining this joint. joint. And uh, synovitis depicted with uh, uh, ultrasound and Doppler. Wrist extensors. Uh, this is these are a topic you have to you have to uh, study with your anatomy book. There are six compartments. First compartment, abductor pollicis longus extensor pollicis brevis. Second extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. And then extensor pollicis longus is the third. Now we have very good uh, landmark is the Lister's tubercle. Uh, this is very good landmark if you uh, if you start to scan uh, patients. Then we have the four fourth compartment extensor of uh, the, uh, fingers. We have the five extensor digiti minimi and ecu extensor carpi ulnaris and this is uh, very specific uh, and uh, prominent for rheumatoid arthritis this is um, if you have a patient who has uh, who have no diagnosis and he has echo inflammation it's very likely to have rheumatoid arthritis this is uh, this is uh, uh, typical for rheumatoid arthritis to get involved echo uh, i have here uh, a video that shows you uh, several uh, tendon sheath uh, inflammation in one young uh, female um, it was clinically uh, uh, impossible to to say. I, I thought it it was uh, uh, radiocarpal joint or wrist joint inflammation clinically. But as you see in the video, there are 
a lot of uh, uh, effusion and proliferation around this tendon. Actually, here is the fourth, and this is the third. This is the third. I'm, I'm moving the transducer to radial site. This is Lister's to Becca, and here's the third compartment goes here. You see this, everything here is uh, inflamed. Second co uh, compartment is here, and here is the first compartment. The, this always, uh, everything is uh, surrounded by synovial uh, hypertrophy. Just showing you that we can make a differentiation between joint inflammation. The joints were perfect, no inflammation, but there was a widespread tenosynovial uh, inflammation also depicted with uh, uh, Doppler, as, as we see here, the first compartment, there was uh, grayscale changes, widening of the tendon sheet with unechogenic material or hypoechoic material, Doppler. And this was the third compartment with goes over the second compartment. Everything is covered by uh, inflammation here seen with Doppler and the fourth compartment. So it was extensive. Um, just, to, just to show you how beneficial uh, ultrasound is. Um, and for example, the, the patient came to ask injection into the joint, but the joint was clean. There was no inflammation. So what I did, I, I injected all these different locus uh, corticosteroid. <clears throat> that was her own only problem, only this area. So it was very nice to put a little bit corticosteroid to all into all the tendon sheaths uh, separately. So we can also depict tendon damage with ultrasound here. For example, is this eruption of the flexor tendon. Trigger finger is very good uh, target for ultrasound. Uh, we, we know the pulleys, A1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. These are the fibrous rings that keep the tendons. Uh, together with bone. And this is the typical site, A1 pulley to get, uh, uh, to get the impingement as seen here in this, in this video. You see, this here is the pulley, this hyper echoic here. And you see that the, there is some enlargement uh, of the of the uh, distal part of the tendon, and it cannot go through the pulley. So it it uh, there is a clearly uh, the it snaps snaps uh, the this is the trigger finger. Ultrasound is very good in diagnosing that, but this is not usually the case in patients with rheumatoid diseases, but anyway, there are other uh, patients suffering this. Might suffer also uh, psoriatic artery or rheumatoid, but usually also healthy other people. <coughs> Here we have a case of uh, synovitis and telosynovitis. <coughs> As you see, there is joint inflammation and uh, uh, tenosynovitis on the joint. De Kerban. This is, uh, ultrasound is very helpful in that uh, to diagnose and also to treat this. It's quite superficial, but it's quite difficult to inject glucocorticoid without ultrasound using only clinical uh, mean. Uh, for example, using this kind of 
hockey stick, small French juicer. It's very nice to put needle under that and exactly into the uh, into the tendon sheath here. It's clinically not easy to, to put needle into the tunnel. Flexor, tenosynovite is off the hand. And then uh, we have uh, flexor tenosynovite is of the finger. Longitude, longitudinal volar scan widening of the tendon sheet, echo, uh, hypoechoic or unechoic ma uh, material in the tendon sheath and with a, a clear Doppler signal. Then we have the carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel is interesting because if you see uh, Doppler and probably a little bit fluid here, this is a very good candidate for glucocorticoid injection. If I don't see any signs of inflammation, I don't put uh, glucocorticoid. Glucocorticoid is a drug for inflammation. Um, then I will come more, more later, I will come and, and tell you about the um, medianus nerve compression. But just uh, to, to, to remind you that in this case, uh, it would be nice to inject glucocorticoid here. And, and how do I do it? I work between medianus and ulnar artery. Ulnar, between ulnar, I put the needle between ulnar artery and medianus. That's the longest distance. That's longer usually than between radial artery and medianus nerve. Just to put here, there is a common tendon sheet here. And if you put somewhere here, the glucocorticoid, it goes everywhere. So uh, you, know, you just need to go under the uh, uh, retina column, which is actually shown here. Example of MCP joint synovitis fluid uh, uh, thickening of the uh, synovium plus uh, Doppler signal. Example of PIP joint synovitis dorsal scan, volar scan of synovitis in grayscale uh, widening of the uh, uh, joint space with uh, hi synovial hypertrophy and Doppler signal. We have already spoken about erosions. Uh, it's an intra-articular discontinuity of the bone surface visible in two planes, in long axis, short axis. What is uh, characteristic uh, for air A is the lo location of bone erosions. And these are radial side of the second and fifth uh, metacarpal, radial and lateral aspects. This is the fifth metacarpal and uh, this uh, second. These are typical sites of erosion in air A. And the styloid of ulna also. You can go around this with your probe from dorsal, lateral to volar. You can go around and try to find the, the uh, um, erosion. For example, if uh, you are suspecting rheumatoid and you are not sure, you are, so uh, check is the erosion here or here. And of course, the fifth metatarsal head. We had uh, earlier uh, talk about this important. But this is uh, very typical for rheumatoid arthritis, this fifth uh, MTP. These are typical locations uh, of bone erosions in 
rheumatoid arthritis. So, and with ultrasound, it is also possible to, to, to follow the progression. Uh, a small, tiny erosion here, but after one year, uh, it has gone. Uh, there, there's a treatment failure and, and uh, there's a progression of, 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 the, of the disease. Um, in this video, I first have the transducer like this in long axis on the dorsal side, and then I move it to the lateral side. So it, uh, so you understand it goes quite rapidly, but you see the really uh, damage. Uh, you see here, it, it's it's not nice. The, the bone bone is uh, uh, it's very uh, disturbed. There is a damage and erosion, especially at this area of the of the RA. Um, but when we are depicting uh, erosions uh, with ultrasound in the hand, we have to understand that there is limited access in joints three and four. So you go, you can go around first uh, MCP joint. You can go around second and fifth, but not third and fifth, uh, fourth. So we have a limited access to uh, 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 third and fourth. And MRI and CT are in this case more, uh, they are better than ultrasound in detecting erosions. For example, I had one patient who had uh, longstanding synovitis in M MCP4. I don't have the ultrasound image and uh, because there was no erosion. But if you took CT, you see there was a clear erosion. What we see with ultrasound is the volar side or the dorsal side. But we cannot see MC, in MCP4 this area here. We, we cannot see this erosion because you cannot have acoustic window because there is a uh, there is not space enough here. So uh, we have to remember that uh, ultrasound is not 100% sure for detecting erosion of the hand. The same in MRI, here is the erosion. The same erosion than seen uh, with uh, CT here. Now cartilage, normal cartilage, is an um, unequoid band over the bone with clear uh, visible uh, surfaces. If you have uh, early uh, OA or cartilage damage, there is blurring of cartilage markings, loss of cartilage ecotexture and thinning. And there is progress, even more and more narrowing and even complete absence of cartilage and, and bony changes too, as well. Uh, in this uh, longitudinal scan of MCP joint, you see that the bones are together. You see, there is no cartilage at all when I'm moving the hand. So there should be uh, normally uh, clear uh, hypo, uh, unechoic zone here, but you can you can with ultrasound also say that this is totally uh, uh, wrong. There is no uh, cartilage. Of course, we take X-rays, but uh, in case you don't have the X-ray available, osteophytes. Uh, it's um, very nice to depict osteophyte dorsally laterally, medially, uh, even on the volar side. Uh, osteophyte of the PIP joint, MCP joint osteophytes. And now, uh, finally, we can have a uh, talk 
about flexor retinaculum and, and carpal tunnel syndrome. Ultrasound offers, uh, along, along with the EMG, uh, a lot of uh, nice performance here. Uh, flexor retinaculum is uh, a few millimeters thick structure that is uh, attached the the so-called entrance is between pisiform bone and scaphoidium here scaphoidium pisiform and why is it is important because the median nerve goes under this uh, retinaculum and then the exit uh, it, it ends at the level of hook of hamate and trapezium. So uh, this, they, they, this uh, fibrotic uh, membrane or flexor retinaculum, it, it forms a roof uh, and the walls and the, the, the ceiling and the, the walls and the floor, floor is uh, made of bone, but this is the uh, let's say roof or floor, how, how you want to say. But anyway, it, it's very often that the median nerve, along with the time, will be uh, there, compressed by the, by the retinaculum. Uh, as you see, ulnar nerve is outside of the retinaculum there it forms small uh, uh, weak retinaculum uh, also but this is very rare in in my practice to have this guyon guyon uh, entrapment but this uh, is very very often seen this uh, uh, median nerve compression what is the ultrasonographic uh, rule how how shall how, how how can we call median nerve compression it's about 10 to 12 square millimeters when you measure measure it uh, if it's more so normal median nerve is about 10 to 12 square millimeters if you measure it under the uh, epineuro uh, in typical carpal tunnel syndrome, there is swelling of the nerve at the proximal carpal uh, tunnel. And then there's flattening in the distal tunnel or at the end of the dis distal tunnel. Here is the uh, flexor retinacle, also called carpal ligament transfer carpal. These are the uh, uh, typical phenomena. For example, in this case, we have uh, the area is fifth, more than 15 square millimeters, so it's too much. Uh, and uh, that's why it is abnormal. And if you, if you have a second uh, rule, the flattening here, so you can be sure that this patient has a uh, uh, pathological median nerve compression. Also, there might be uh, morphological changes like, like lowering of the fascicles. As I said, the median nerve is covered by epineurium and there are perineurium and these fascicles. Uh, but in case of uh, uh, entrapment, you can uh, lose this uh, typical uh, fascicular, fascicular pattern. Uh, sometimes even Doppler signal can be seen here. Uh, once again, uh, median nerve compression. <clears throat> First, enlargement of the nerve. Here, only 12 square millimeter, but then extreme flattening. You see zero, 
uh, sorry, uh, five square uh, millimeter. And then I call this um, post-stenotic dilatation, very often seen. There is, for a reason or another, there is a, such a dilatation after the with huge uh, uh, widening of the of the ten of the median nerve. I have here a, a nice video, also from that. Now that we have a, a transfer scan, and I go from. Uh, proximal to distal. I move in the probe over the carpal tunnel and see what uh, happens here. The nerve is here, it gets enlarged, it's, but now flattening, you see, it's very flat and now again uh, uh, enlarged. It is the same uh, as we just saw. So uh, huge enlargement and then flattening here, very small, and then again, enlargement. So, uh, Utrasan offers very nice way to examine uh, carpal tunnel syndrome uh, also. Okay, uh, I, I see that uh, I have spent a little bit less time than then I should, but uh, with this with this photo, I will end this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Johan. Excelente. Muchas gracias uh, por su excelente charla. Hay muchas preguntas para, para el final. Continuamos, este Jesús, con la tercera. César, ¿quieres hacer las preguntas pertinentes a este tema ahora que tenemos un poco de tiempo o quieres dejarlo para el final? Yo creo, yo creo que al final, para, para conversar inclusive con tu aporte, como igual que el día de ayer. ¿Te parece? Yeah. Sí. Eh, sí. Podría ser. Pues. Ok, let's continue the next lecture. Ok. Ok, we are going to send to the final part for the question and answer. We are going just to lecture. Ok. Ya. Yeah. Uh, wait, I try to, I try to. Okay. Pues la tercera conferencia de la mañana es gota, evaluación de la gota. Yes, gout, okay. Gout. Gout. Gracias. Uh, is the sharing is not... All right. Where is this change? No, cancer. Okay, just wait. I'm I'm uh, I'm trying to find this uh, okay. now. Very oh, good. Very good. I make the screen better for me. Uh, okay. Yes. Just a minute. Excellent. And uh, now, like this. Okay. Okay. You see the screen and you hear my voice, right? Thank you. Right. Yes. Okay. So the final talk uh, uh, is about gout and crystal deposition disorders. This is, uh, I like this uh, topic <laughs> so, somehow because I think it's quite clear and, and ultrasound offers so much. Uh, the research has produced so much material during the, let's say, 10 years that it has shown that uh, uh, crystal, the evaluation of crystal deposition diseases is very, very well made with ultrasound. And as we know, 
uh, at least in in Western world, uh, gout is has increased enormously after the Second World War for many reasons. But and and so in daily daily life, uh, uh, gout is very important uh, in different uh, diagnosis of of uh, new uh, arthritis, especially in men. So uh, you, uh, in acute arthritis, you, you always must uh, think about gout. Yeah, so it's, it's very important. For example, this kind of, uh, of lesions uh, you, you may see in emergency rooms or, or, or in, in GPs too. You, you may wonder, is it uh, erysipelas or, or what? But gout is always uh, uh, have to be remembered. Uh, we have uh, different imaging modalities for gout. For example, X-rays, we have CT, DECT. I just uh, tell you something about DECT. I'm not a, a specialist in that and not specialist in MRI. But uh, then we have sonography. Sonography is the only imaging method that can cover the whole uh, 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 life of gout. We see in very early gout, uh, even in hyperuricemia state, uh, we can examine patient. We, we, say, we call it intercritical gout when we have crystals and flares. And then we have a chronic arthropathy uh, gout, according to Gurdjieff Geely. This is, I think, a nice, uh, nice uh, cartoon. Um, so um, it is also possible to, with other modalities to depict, to, to uh, de depict gout, but uh, sonography is excellent. Uh, why we see uh, gout and crystalline material with uh, ultrasound because crystalline material reflects ultrasound waves. And we have some specific uh, features in gout. Double contour sign, I will tell you that about that later. Dofus and aggregates are uh, relatively specific. Then you have, of course, non specific. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, fluid, excess synovial fluid, or so-called snowstorm. We, we, we can see synovial hypertrophy in gout, as well as in other uh, uh, chronic diseases. And we can see Doppler signal uh, in gout and crystal arthropathies. Omerak, again, uh, has done very good work in defining uh, uh, lesions and uh, uh, examining the reliability of, of their scoring systems. And so uh, now the, the most important specific feature for gout using ultrasound is double contour. Double contour. It is, uh, we have with ultrasound a bony white line, but on that is an a new uh, white line. So contour, double contour. It's an abnormal hyperechoic band over the superficial margin of the car, articular hyaline cartilage, independent of the angle of insonation, which may either irregular or regular, continuous or intermittent, and can be this. this distinguished from the cartilage interface sign. So you see here the uh, anatomic, when you open the uh, joint, this is porridge-like material. This is gout. This forms the double contour. It's the gouty material. And, the, and this here is normal joint so-called cartilage interface sign. When the ultrasound beam comes, comes here, there is a change of acoustic impedance. And that's why there is white, tiny 
reflection of wave. But you can't not see it when the intonation is different here. Yeah. But in couch, double contour can be seen going down here. This is typical, continuous, intermittent, and, and can be distinguished from Cartlett's interface sign. This is normal interface sign, tiny little white line. And it's, it's uh, uh, you can distinguish it. Now there is a, uh, published in uh, uh, seminars in arthritis and rheumatism, Omeract work, new semi-quantitative ultrasound scoring system. They have, after several uh, trials and, and a lot of talks and meetings, <laughs> they have made a conclusion to score gout like this, to use uh, this kind of atlas. Grade one is normal, but then comes very important grade one, which is up, which is possible. So this is possible. This is not mild case. So this is nothing to do with gout. It's just possible. It might be gout or might be not. And now grade two is uh, gout. This is minimal gout. And grade three is obvious gout. So, uh, they have uh, uh, thought a lot of these things and make uh, letters and emails <laughs> to, to, uh, to trying to, and they have uh, made, made a conclusion that this kind of approach is uh, 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 relevant. Uh, Atlas that makes uh, us to say normal, uh, obvious, possible, possible count and then uh, uh, definite cut. Double contour uh, in knee joint here. You already saw actually uh, here, uh, double contour here compared to age and sex match, healthy male. Double contour on the lateral femoral condyle cartilage. Uh, the, uh, you see in the small uh, image here on uh, right down uh, how the transducer is. The tiny level contour. Here is on the volar side of the foot, MTP5, double contour on the plantar side. And then we have the second uh, uh, phenomenon, tofus, uh, uh, nasty material taken uh, out of the uh, joint. Okay, it's tofus, but <laughs> with ultrasound, we see it like this. Circumscribed, inhomogeneous, hyperechoic or hypoechoic aggregation which may not may or may not generate acoustic shadow. I will come on this later, which may be surrounded by small rim. So uh, this kind of a grayscale material found in, in uh, joint may be uh, gout. And again, uh, this uh, semi-quantitative ultrasound system, uh, this uh, Atlas type, the same. No gout, possible gout, grade one. It's, it's not gout, it's possible gout. And then we have a clear gout. You see here, uh, double contour and uh, aggregation of uh, tofus. Huge tofus here, grade three, definite and severe. Uh, example, here we have, uh, Tofus, what is aggregate? I will come on that later. But, but you see here, uh, actually, here is no uh, uh, double contour, but you see here, uh, this was a gout uh, with Doppler. So it was uh, inflamed MTB1. Um, tofus can be found in patellar tendon and tendons too. Here, 
uh, tofus in the distal patellar tendon. How can I say that this is tofus? Only because I, I made an aspiration. There's a chronic inflammation here, like this. I, uh, the the uh, <clears throat> needle is in transfers uh, under the patella, like this. Uh, and I aspirate it a little bit inside the, uh, you get a little aspiration, which can be blow out from the needle and put it on the microscope. So you see these uh, crystals. Cauti olecranon bursitis. Again, I, I cannot say sh for sure that this is gout, but when I put my uh, needle in and, and put it in the uh, uh, microscope, I can see the crystals. Here are aggregates. This is grayscale material. Uh, for example, now I show you the video that didn't uh, play well yesterday. This is olecranon bursitis. Again, grayscale material can be compressed, it's fluid. But this was Staphylococcus aureus uh, bursitis depicted at this area. Okay, and again, needle in, bus out and the diagnosis. So I just wanted to say here that uh, I always use uh, aspiration if I'm not sure what I'm, what's going on. Triceps tendinitis, again, needle in, you can be sure that it's gout. Um, one uh, example of a 55 years old patient who had enormous prepatellar, or we could also say infrapatellar bursitis. This is also infrapatellar. And uh, you see how much material I got out there. It's like a milk. I got it here from the soft. When I'm compressing it now, look, nothing happens here because this is stone. This is like stone. This is uh, acoustic shadowing. This is so thick gout that the um, beam cannot go through it. But here, it can go through. It's fluid here, it's soft. And I, I take the material, this material out here. So this was a huge untreated gout with uh, hard uh, tofi and soft uh, uh, tofi. Tofi in the dip joint. Actually, we don't need any ultrasound here because it's so obvious. Anyway, uh, the, uh, this is the nail, nail is here. Tofus in the nose. This was a strange. Mm -hmm. uh, I I just put the transducer here and saw uh, echoigenic material. Put the needle in and caught white material, which was uh, uh, crystals. <laughs> In this uh, uh, um, picture, we see double contour, yes. Uh, and uh, at least grade two, it's uh, minimal, but obvious. And then we see possible uh, tofus material here. Count in the mid-tarsal joints, that is quite tricky and you have to, very carefully uh, examine this. You see here some material in this joint and it was really uh, gout, gouty material, fluid and uh, probably tofi here. Tarso metatarsal joint, uh, gout and talonavicula. So uh, if you are, uh, you have to be, uh, look very carefully. Uh, these changes are very small and tiny. What is aggregate? They are heterogeneous, hyperechoic foggy here that, uh, that maintain their high degree of re reflectivity. 
even when the gain setting is minimized. All the insonation angle is changed, and which occasionally may generate posterior acoustic shadowing. So aggregates uh, are white spots in the uh, tofus. There is a new uh, redefined uh, aggregates uh, uh, by, by, by uh, this uh, OMERACT. And they say that aggregates can only be scored in a patient if other ultrasound features are suggestive for gout, such, such as double contour and, uh, and or tophi. So, uh, so the, the aggregates are not specific and not easy to say that this is gout. You have to see, you actually you have to first see the double contour and, and it's, it's related to, again, aggregates. We don't have aggregates, possible we have aggregates. And then there is a definite aggregate because there is double, double contour here. Okay. In this image, you see tofus and aggregates. In this image, we will see double contour, yes, and uh, aggregates and tofus, all these three components. Erosion, of course, there might be erosions also in, in uh, uh, gout. Uh, we, we, we skip that. Um, how about ultrasound? Is it sensitive to change? When you, when you depict longitudinally, there is a Pete Ado, 23 patients. The, he followed two years uh, patient, and, and, and he noted that uh, double contour MTB1 uh, got down in two years. Double contour knee also went down, uh, Tofi not so well in, in, in MTB1. And, and tophi in knee didn't decrease almost at all. Uh, and tophi at patellar tender. This was quite a small study, but uh, okay. Uh, but uh, uh, Peteado's work showed also that Doppler, the uh, amount of inflammation goes down, yes, in two, two years. In first MTP, patellar, knee, and global. But much bigger uh, work was done by uh, Hilde Berner Hammer and colleagues. They had more than 200 people, patients, uh, 56 years mean, and they had gout for eight years. They had a very uh, intensive uh, treatment. They put the urate level from 500 to 300. So what they found, they found that they first examined MT1, MTP2, wrist, distal, femur, cartilage, talar, triceps, quadriceps, patellar, achilles tendons. They examined all this and they made a score of all that. And, and at the baseline, double contour was, uh, score was 4.3. And you see it went down in one year. Some to, to, some score 6.5 down aggregates down, all some score down. So this is quite a uh, uh, positive finding that if you treat gout uh, and try to put the urate level down, you can get results. And, and this, uh, to resolve this uh, uh, gouty material out of the body. But I want to um, highlight here, uh, one very important uh, thing that joint aspiration, because as I said, I always uh, try to make the diagnosis perfect and, and sure. And I take a sample for microscopy. For example, here is a so-called red hand 
coming from the emergency room, what is this? Is it erysipelas? Uh, if it's erysipelas, it's not allowed to go with the needle, but I'm sure I saw double contour. Uh, this is a very small image and, and there's inflammation in the joint. So I go through this red skin because I'm sure that the, the reason for the red hand is in the joint. So, and, and, and uh, to, just to take a sample of, of uh, gouty material out there. And, and I, I personally uh, love to have the combination of ultrasound and microscope. I have microscope in my room and I recommend that for all doctors too, because you, you can uh, make your diagnosis uh, with ultrasound first and use ultrasound guidance for aspiration. And then you can uh, very rapidly uh, verify out. Uh, it's much more efficient than to send the sample to laboratory. It takes hours or even more. So everything is ready when the patient gets uh, trousers on. <laughs> I, I'm waiting already with my receipt. Okay, fruitful combination of ultrasound and microscope. Uh, some words about DECT. Um, DECT is a method, dual energy CT method that can, is very uh, uh, nice to, to depict uh, URAD deposits in colors, but uh, it has a uh, limit, limitation is that it's for non, it's, it's for uh, TOFA course scout. It, it has a limited sensitivity if there is no clear uh, TOFI. Um, but the diagnostic performance of, of this dual energy C CT is, uh, according to the systematic literature, is uh, it's quite high. <coughs> Excuse me. Sensitivity 0 0.81, specificity 0 0.91. Uh, but uh, sensitivity is very low if you have a recent onset gout. So if you have only fluid, uh, very often we, we don't have uh, TOFI uh, in, in very early gout, you just have fluid. Um, European League Against Rheumatism and also American colleague of rheumatology, uh, they have um, uh, rules how to depict image gout. Um, if you have a double contour or decked, uh, you get four points. If you have typical foot erosion in x-ray, it's four, four points. Uh, these typical erosions are uh, stencil, it's uh, rounded, uh, clear erosions. And uh, so this is enough to, to, to diagnose gout. You, of course, you must have the anamnesis and, and uh, the, the case must uh, fit with gout. So, but um, actually, according, according to this uh, article, we don't have to necessarily take even aspiration if, if you see this. Uh, the case is closed. The case is clear if you if you see double contour and if you have even uh, erosion and the uh, the case fits with gout. Now uh, words from CPPD. Calcium deposition uh, uh, disease uh, seen in, with uh, uh, microscope. They they resemble uh, gouty crystals, but. Uh, um, a little bit are different uh, in microscope. Um, according to uh, uh, Omeract, uh, synovial fluid in CPPD, uh, they find hyperechoic deposits, variable size, localized 
uh, within the synovial fluid without posterior shadowing and mobile. Uh, they say that this could be uh, um, CPPD, but I think that uh, very often we see in patients with OA, this kind of uh, phenomenon, I would like to have more studies of, of this. Um, CPPD and synovial fluid, according to Filippo, there's increase in deposition when we go from left to right. This is a nice way to, to I have these uh, photos uh, more uh, later. But here we don't see, we see here uh, probably some, and here are more, one, two, three, four, five. Here are uh, more uh, in, in synovial fluid, and here are enormous uh, amount of these tiny little uh, uh, white spots. X-ray is nice to show chondrocalcinosis. So that is what we see when the CPPD crystals are in, inside, the, uh, inside the cartilage in the knee joint and in the hand. Triangular cartilage here, fibrocartilage. That's a, a accumulation of uh, CVPD in uh, hand. Now, the very important uh, thing is that this, in high lane cartilage, CVPD crystals are hyper, hyper echoic deposits of variable size and shape without posterior shadowing and localizing within, should be underlined, within the hyaline cartilage. Remain fixed and move along with the hyaline cartilage during dynamic assessment. So inside the cartilage, this is important. And this is actually the same we see in X-rays, this chondrocalcinosis. But this is much more uh, sensitive to, to depict. Once again, uh, the differentiation of gout, CPPD, and normal, how does it look like in uh, ultrasound? Normal, uh, uh, an echoic black zone over the bone with a small, tiny white line, but double contour in gout. And in CVPD, intra cartilage calcification. This is, this is the uh, nice image, uh, uh, how to differentiate this conditions. And now CVPD in typical sites, as I said, and we already saw in x-ray fiber cartilage uh, in hand, hyaline cartilage somewhere, this is somewhere, the joint fluid, these uh, uh, white spots and tender. And knee again. Um, Philip Pucci, made in uh, 2009, a study showed that uh, calcification were found in 33 patients out of 48 of CVPD patients. So it's very common site, uh, this knee joint. If you are suspecting and you want to find look at the knee joint. And now we have uh, again, Filippo's excellent image, how to see CVPD in MCP joint, normal, just a little bit probably. There is something even more and even, uh, even more here. Okay, this is, I think, very nice. There is osteophyte there. Okay, this is the triangular fibrocartilage uh, ultrasound x-ray. 
I uh, yesterday, uh, or was it uh, day one, we were talking about the uh, knee joint. We already saw this uh, menis calcified meniscus. This is very uh, common uh, and very nice way to diagnose CPPT. There are two cases, partial uh, calcifications and so-called called white uh, meniscus here. It jumps to your eye when you when you look at the meniscus. It it, it is very different than normal uh, normal uh, gray meniscus. Even in hip labrum, there might be uh, in uh, normal labrum just a little bit calcification. Even more here is a, lo a lot of more. Uh, and uh, I have actually one case. I remember a 50 years old female had an acute hip pain. He had a CRP more than 100. And uh, the, the uh, ultrasound of the hip joint was, uh, it was not normal. It was a little bit enlarged uh, distance between bone and capsule compared to other side. It was completely normal. And look at the labrum. Her labrum was uh, like this, and it, there was some uh, gray uh, material. Uh, and I put needle here and got out uh, milk-like material, and it was obvious, the CPPD uh, disease. But this, this was very good clue, this uh, abnormal labrum. Uh, which we just uh, saw in the Philippos uh, image. In a AC joint can be found also uh, uh, this <laughs> this region is like a meniscus, but actually it is AC, AC joint. So increasing deposition, uh, accumulation of CPPD. According to Philippos excellent uh, excellent uh, way to, 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 to show pathology increasing pathology also in tendons we, we can have CBPD but as you see it's it's um, it's a probably it's it reserve it's like an endosophite but probably it's, it's more soft and and it's more uh, in gout it's 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 really more even more soft tissue here and chronic calcification are more hard, uh, but uh, it can be difficult to, to, to say uh, using ultrasound or what's, what's all about. Uh, just a few examples of uh, CPPD in tendon. It, it seems to be uh, attachment, probably a patellar to distal uh, end of patellar more and more uh, uh, increasing the position of CPPD. Uh, now, just uh, to remind you that we were talking about uh, uh, double contour. Uh, the double contour is a sign of gout, but it can in some extent be also found in uh, CPPD because the calcification is in the ligament or joint capsule. This is not on the cartilage. It's, it's here. And, and you can differentiate it so that, in this case, this is the head of radius. You, you move the radius and you see that there is uh, this uh, stays. It doesn't move together if it's on the cartilage it should move when you when you move the radius so uh, this is accumulation of cppd uh, in the uh, joint capsule so but it resembles double contour but actually is not dynamic study is needed filippo has also also found that 
you can find uh, CVPD around uh, tendons two and, and in the joint capsule, as I, as I said. Where can you find CVPD with ultrasound? There are typical sites, according to Filippo, uh, is the wrist and knee. We just uh, have had several examples of that. If you, if he look at uh, 42 patients, he, he found uh, wrist and knee it was the most important uh, joints and, and also axilla tendon and plantar fascia was, uh, uh, CVPD was found. Um, uh, how good is uh, ultrasound in diagnosing of calcium prophosphate deposition disease? <clears throat> Filippo also has made a uh, systematic literature review and meta analysis, and the sensitivity, uh, according to this, is very good 75, specificity even better uh, 98. So this is the uh, apple tree flowers last uh, spring. I hope that we sometimes can see this again. And this was the final, final image I have to show you. And I hope you all good in, in Peru. And, and probably we now can have a discussion about this subject. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Johani. Great conference, lectures. Uh, very, very, very. Thank you, Dr. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, Jesús, uh, hacemos un break or pasamos a las preguntas? Uh, would you like a break or? No, no, like... no, no. We can. Yo creo que pasamos a las preguntas. Perfecto, perfecto. Uh, eh, 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 es conocido ¿no? que las enfermedades cero negativas, ligadas, ahí lo comentaste, ligadas a HIV-27, eh, y ustedes tienen una gran casuística. Quisiera para empezar, y por favor al auditorio para que envíen sus preguntas, eh, eh, sin duda tiene mucha experiencia en evaluar, además de a, a, este, a, AR y eh, artritis psoriásica, eh, enfermedades como Reiter, ¿no? que también afectan a, a, este, al, al primer dedo, básicamente, a las articulaciones, y quizás con BZ, aunque esto se ve más en las, en las poblaciones eh, eh, árabes. ¿no? Eh, ¿Podrías comentarle eso al doctor, por favor? Si ¿Sí podría ampliarnos el, el, el valor del ultrasonido, sin duda, en enfermedades de ese tipo, como Reiter, enfermedad BZ, básicamente. Mm. Io anche sì, io so, me lo impallo con che mi sta a rispondere l'artropatia, con che chi so gli asi, che chi è reattivo in artriti. Io se ne voglio poco a ne mala ienta, eh, quindi a tarchia un ultrani, le orientazioni io guarda, se la esa sarà oxia. So, e se, se tu stai specificamente orientato alla, ti riferi a allo scaso saguto, o sea, cual, qual è il interesse che ti gustaria? Básicamente porque hemos, hemos escuchado con eh, muy importante esa diferenciación, por ejemplo, de la mano con AR y la mano con psoriasis. Es fundamental yeah. y el valor del Doppler, ¿no? Y si eso podemos extenderlo, por ejemplo, en enfermedades como la enfermedad de Reiter o enfermedad de BZ, básicamente hallazgos ecográficos en la, en la mano. Eh, eh, ongo, ongo, eh, yo, ongo, si no está tan mal BZ, so harbina it's 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 very rare in finland this yeah. species disease this is genetically not we don't see that uh, much and uh, my uh, experience with ultrasound is, is very low i i don't it's it's a very uh, extremely rare eh, exacto, o sea, es una enfermedad muy rara en Finlandia, o sea, está ligada a la, rita, a la, a la ruta de la, de la seda, ¿no? Donde, por ejemplo, en, el, en un hospital en Estambul, creo que podrían haber 40 pacientes, 
¿no? Porque es una enfermedad, vamos a decir, nacional de Turquía, ¿no? Entonces, eh, nosotros tenemos, hemos tenido, digamos, algunos casos de BESET, eh, generalmente son extranjeros, aunque también hay algunos casos de personas que son auténticamente finlandeses, ¿no? Eh, en el caso del BESET, eh, eh, quizás, digamos, la importancia radica en el componente arterial y venoso, ¿no? O sea, del, del tipo de trombosis arteriovenosas, etcétera, eh, o sea, hay compromisos vasculares, ¿no? O sea, eh, nosotros hemos tenido, por ejemplo, casos de, vamos a decirle, de casos de, en caso de un acné atípico, ¿no? En localizaciones bizarras, ¿no? O sea, normalmente el, el acné o la, la, la rosácea tiene un patrón de distribución característico, ¿no? En la, en la cara, en en la, en la espalda, pero cuando el, eh, a nivel, digamos, de piel es bizarro, hay la sospecha de BC, y hemos tenido casos de sospecha, pero pocos casos de confirmación, o sea, como que a nivel, digamos, de ultrasonido, eh, no tenemos mucha experiencia como que lo tienen los turcos, como lo tienen los árabes, como lo tienen los mediterráneos, ¿no? Perfecto. En la primera charla de la evaluación de la artritis reumatoide, eh, Obviamente el, 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 el uso del Doppler es, es extraordinario, ¿no? Entonces, eh, quisiera más bien que para los radiólogos es más fácil porque estamos eh, continuamente trabajando con, con el ecógrafo, ver todos esos parámetros que muy bien indicó el doctor, PRF, eh, la ganancia, eh, utilizar Doppler Color, Doppler Power, que es más sensible, el color le bajamos el PRF hasta 2, hasta 1. Mm. Eh, y para los reumatólogos que están acá, que también son varios, quisiera que enfatice esos aspectos técnicos que son importantes en la evaluación del Doppler en artritis reumatoide. <tose> Hasta que hay que doppler omina y suxia, que hay que parametrir, yo casi no sé, tama, con sinatet. Yo casi no le da, que hay que tama, sensibilidad, tama, pear. Sí, sí, sí. 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 Sí, Uh, even less if it's possible, but you, normally there is shaking of the hand. You cannot uh, put that lower. Then raise, when you have put that 500, raise color so much that there is noise. And then you have to reduce it under the noise. And then um, these are the main two important uh, adjustments for slow flow. And then If you have done, done that, you, you can check your color frequency. Usually they are ranging from six to uh, uh, 11 or something like that. So it, uh, usually four or uh, five uh, adjustments. You can try this, which is good for your, your specific joint. Then the fourth, is uh, the uh, uh, this uh, well first of all you have to put the color box so that it's on the top so that there is no uh, artificial flow coming into the box this was the most important <laughs> i didn't tell it in the first place so it was the uh Uh, this was this was the most important uh, adjustment, and then was this uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, let's repeat it: the pulse repetition frequency and the color gain. Color gain uh, are the the two most important, uh, and it re, it 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 depends on the machine. You might might have nowadays very good machines, very uh, sensitive uh, for slow flow. I have seen this wonderful new technology goes on and on, and 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 uh, uh, it, it is very nice. Espero que hayan entendido 
eh, todos los parámetros, ¿no? O sea, eh, yo, yo, por ejemplo, lo que he notado, o sea, una de las características, lo que él resalta es poner la, la ventana del Doppler en la parte alta, ¿no es cierto? Ese es un aspecto muy importante. Otro aspecto bien importante es ponerle en slow flow, ¿no? o sea, es solamente para, para suprimir, digamos, otros vasos sanguíneos, ¿no? Los vasos Entonces, de, vasos de, bol, de flujo lento. ¿no? Eh, sí, efectivamente. Entonces, en slow flow, que es otra de las características que él, digamos, y, la, y todos los otros parámetros que él ha resaltado, ¿no? Generalmente ya las máquinas, estas multipropósitos que, que tenemos, tienen pues un preset. ¿No? Entonces uno le pone el preset de músculo esquelético, incluso ahora hay preset de mano, etcétera, de hombro. Yes, you're right. There are in some machines there is all, already a button for slow flow, and it it right to uh, adjust the machine puts it automatically. But uh, this uh, um, uh, Thor Pedersen is uh, king of of Doppler from, from Denmark, uh, they have shown that these machine settings are not the, the, op, the, the best. The, the, there are uh, always, if you, if you can manually uh, adjust mm. this, it, it, you can get better results. Yeah, sí. O sea, que a pesar de que, digamos, eh, slow flow viene en las máquinas ya, como digamos, uh, como... Resetear. Sí, efectivamente. Eh, sin embargo, el, por ejemplo, el, uno de los gurús que es de Dinamarca recomienda la, el ajuste manual, ¿no? Porque obviamente eh, la, contextura, la contextura del paciente es distinta, ¿no? La máquina o sea, es máquina. La máquina no, y la contextura del paciente es distinta, el ángulo es distinto, entonces el flujo es distinto, y eh, si está cerca una arteria, si está algo, un elemento, un hueso que disturbia, digamos, el, entonces uno tiene que ajustar en, en función de la del nivel de penetración de lo que uno quiere ver, ¿no? Entonces, la, el, el ajuste manual es, es fundamental. Uh -huh. este, cuando hizo la diferenciación de la artritis de, de la evaluación de ecografía de AR con psoriasis, nos dijo que la evaluación del peritenón, la inflamación del peritenón, es la primera, principal diferencia y mostró el valor del Doppler, ¿no? Sí. Entonces... Quisiera que amplíe un poquito más porque eso es sumamente importante, sumamente importante porque una cosa es ver el fluido con ecos dentro de la articulación y otra cosa es ver la inflamación en el alrededor del tendón, ¿no? Quisiera por favor que eso. Peritendinitis, más espondilofropatía, yo tengo tarqueasia, es un yohanjalo allí, sino todo esto está más. Ok, yes, yes. Uh, in in uh, psoriatic arthritis, we see this uh, paratendon, peritendon uh, inflammation that is uh, typical for psoriatic arthritis. And then this, uh, we don't see this sausage finger like phenomenon in. in, in Uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Sí, o sea, la, sí, la, la, los, dedos en, los dedos en salchicha no uh, se ven en la artritis reumatoidea. Es, uh, pat, es patrimonio de la artritis psoriásica. Yeah, and, and the, the distribution of inflammation is important also. We have this distal uh, joint uh, is in psoriasis and, and PIP, MCP is claro. in, in, in rheumatoid. El, la distribución de las articulaciones comprometidas es totalmente distinta. Entonces, a nivel claro, de... es, es clásico, ¿no? Y cuando enseñamos a los residentes radiografías, ¿no? Cogemos yeah, yeah, una yeah, mano, yeah. como dices, una mano y dices, artritis reumatoide, carpo, articulación metacarpofalángico, ese es el territorio del AR. Territorio de artritis, es artritis psoriásica, primer dedo y distales, ¿no es cierto? Yes. Yes, I, I understood this. Yes. Yeah. Sí, efectivamente. Es, es claro. Ahora, eh, esas imágenes que nos mostró de, de la mano, las muñecas son espectaculares, muy bonitas. Eh, cuando uno evalúa, sí, cuando uno evalúa el dedo en gatillo, eh, siempre evalúa la polea a uno. Eh, ¿Siempre considera las dimensiones de la polea en uno o dos milímetros? Eso y la evaluación dinámica, que es importante. ¿Podría ampliar eso, por favor? Yeah. 
son de la cocina 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 sina sina eh, repite eh, eh, se cita o sea la, la polea 1 y 2 dices no eh, 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 lo que hablamos es la polea 1 se habló de la polea 1 como dijo el doctor eh, qué dimensiones considera como mínimo normal de esa polea yo tama polea number 1 1 bien usually the dimensions of the polea number 1 what is the, the range of ah, the it's only few millimeters Oh, yeah. It's a hyper echoic uh, on the usually not easy to see, but uh, no es fácil de ver. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a uh, it's uh, on the on the uh, on the volar side uh, at the level of MCP. Uh, o sea, del lado del, del, del lado volar hacia el nivel sí, de la articulación yeah. de la yeah. carpo falangica. Yeah, it's here. Sí, sí. De pocos milímetros. Claro, normalmente, normalmente no se ve pues la polea, ¿no? Entonces, cuando hay este aumento del tamaño de la polea, ya el, el tendón, el flexor, se atraca, pues, ¿no? Y salta. Sí, sí. Y salta, sí. ¿no? Como lo demostró ahí el doctor, ¿no? Eh, nosotros vemos este, en buena cantidad esto, el dedo en gatillo y la enfermedad de Curvain, ¿no? En, en el hospital es, es, es frecuente eso. Sí. Eso. El, las dimensiones del nervio mediano en el túnel del carpo eh, siempre es en axial y eh, entre 10 y 11 milímetros, perdón, 11 milímetros cuadrados, ¿no? Eso por favor también podría ampliar. O sea, está más germo, mediano germo, está más, está más, ¿cómo que me va a ir esto? ¿Qué me va a ir esto? 10, 12 milímetros cuadrados, 10 a 12. Yes. Eh, ¿Utiliza Doppler para la evaluación del, del, del nervio mediano? ¿En qué se muta? ¿Quiere el suyo ser cubato? ¿Este sí no puede ser? No lo usa de rutina, pero en la literatura se reporta de que se puede usar, ¿no? Así es, así es. Ahora, eh, la evaluación del, del cartílago, eh, nosotros siempre evaluamos el cartílago en flexión en la rodilla. Ya. Pero este, por, el, por los tiempos, porque tú sabes la cantidad de pacientes que tenemos. Entonces, si me pongo a evaluar cartílago de todo el cuerpo, pues con un paciente estaría toda una mañana, ¿no? Y la gente me mata en la puerta. Ah. <ríe> ¿Qué, ¿Qué recomienda? Este, eh, a mí me gusta, por ejemplo, evaluar el de, de la rodilla, ¿no? Con sí. eso ya tengo un, un, un esquema general. Uh -huh. ¿Es importante eso o hay que evaluar todo? O sea, perdón, re, o sea, te, uh, no, no te he entendido bien, Cecita. O sea, tú para, dices... evaluar el, para evaluar el cartílago, sí. el cartílago, sí. ¿no? Generalmente utilizamos la flexión de la rodilla, el transductor perpendicular y veo el cartílago como el otro sí. lo ha mostrado. Sí. Las dos líneas finas y el contenido anecoico. Sí. ¿no? Bien definido. Entonces, cuando me piden evaluar cartílago, yo puedo solo dirigirme, por el tiempo me refiero acá en nosotros, por el tiempo, solo a la rodilla, o es necesario hacer un mapeo de todo el cartílago, de todo el cuerpo, como hemos mostrado ah, por el tiempo. Cartílago de todo el cuerpo. No, no, nosotros no, no, generalmente no hacemos una evaluación integral, depende, digamos, o sea, generalmente la evaluación del cartílago es cuando se hace una evaluación de la osteoartrosis, de la artrosis, ¿no? O sea, para ver, digamos, el, ahí hay una clasificación que él ha hecho en la que está incluido el menisco, la producción del menisco, si es de menor de 4 milímetros, si es que eh, hay osteofitos y si es que hay una, digamos, dependiendo el grado de leve, moderado, digamos, de la simétrico, asimétrico de la, de la reducción del cartílago, o sea, en forma regional, ¿no? Mm. Eh, hay, eh, la evaluación del cartílago prácticamente de acuerdo al doctor lo hizo en el, mostrando el dedo, que es un lugar donde se puede perfectamente se puede evaluar claro. el de la rodilla, porque en otros la accesibilidad, no hay una ventana, digamos, ecográfica para evaluar en otras partes, ¿no? Uh -huh. O sea, no, en todo caso es una visión parcial, no es una visión sistemática. Entonces, eh, nosotros hacemos la evaluación del cartílago de la rodilla como parte de un examen de rutina. Yo lo hago siempre, o sea, todos mis pacientes lo hago siempre. 
y, y a veces, digamos, no necesariamente, o sea, con el doctor Yuhani, eh, obviamente la, la posición de, de flexión extrema es la mejor, pero a veces cuando estamos evaluando en la primera parte, o sea, en la región prepatelar, donde se ve, digamos, parte también, empezamos a evaluar más o menos para formarnos una idea. Uh -huh. Claro, si no, también sentado, ¿no? Sentado con el traductor perpendicular. Ah, claro. Eh, claro. Te, te contaba este, que estamos nosotros en Cayetano con nuestro nuevo tomógrafo, ¿no? Tenemos un tomógrafo muy bonito de 128 líneas y tiene energía dual. Sí. Entonces, justo el doctor habló del valor de la energía dual para estudio del TOFO. Eh, quiero que haga un comentario general, esto es la, una pregunta de radiólogo. ¿Cuál es la experiencia ahí en su hospital de energía, o en todo caso en Finlandia, y en los países escandinavos. En general, en, las, en, la, en general, en, las, en la evaluación del sistema músculo esquelético, sí, energía sí. dual. Yo, yo, eh, sí, o sea, mira, yo pues, eh, en el hospital universitario en Helsinki se usaba como, vamos a decir, como una eh, como una tecnología piloto, digamos, para evaluar, ¿no? Y de ahí hay también un radiólogo que es eh, orientado a músculo esquelético y nosotros teníamos eh, conversatorios, digamos, de clínicos, eh, clínicos radiológicos donde se evaluaba, ¿no? Entonces, eh, obviamente la, la enfermedad, como dice el doctor Yuhani, no, no tiene la sensibilidad suficiente para una enfermedad, o sea, vamos a decirle para la gota aguda, sino para la enfermedad crónica tof, to, don, del tofiasia. Entonces, ahí es donde obviamente hay, digamos, una serie de, vamos a decir, una etapa de caracterización que antes, digamos, era inaccesible al ojo, porque el ojo solamente veía articulaciones, pero de acuerdo con esta tecnología se puede ver en tejidos blandos, ¿no? En, en distribuciones que antes no se conocían. Entonces tú, pues, es, es interesante cómo, digamos, la historia, vamos a decir, la, 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 la nosografía de la gota, obviamente está modificando gracias a esa tecnología, pero es una visión parcial, uh -huh. obviamente, porque no es una... De, acá en el hospital no tenemos eso, o sea, el hospital es eh, un hospital regional, vamos a decirle, y dependemos de un hospital universitario en, en Cuopio, no, 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 creo que no se usa tampoco en copio, porque obviamente, como te digo, o sea, eh, eh, yo creo que por el carácter de ser un hospital universitario en Helsinki, eh, es como una especie de una tecnología piloto. Todavía, honestamente, no sé cuáles son, digamos, las aplicaciones y en qué casos, digamos, lo están usando actualmente, ¿no? Muy bien, no sé si hay alguna pregunta del auditorio. ¿Alguien se anima? Jesús, Jesús Domínguez es mi residente, muy, muy acucioso, para en todos los cursos. Jesús, no te he escuchado hablar. <risa> <risa> mi tocayo. Sí, tu tocayo. Ahora está rotando en intervencionismo en Revagliati, no. Y ya se ha enamorado, porque él está enamorado de ultrasonido, ahora ya se enamoró del del intervencionismo. También está el doctor Renzo Rivas. Renzo, ¿cómo estás? Él es reumatólogo y hace ultrasonido. Parece, parece que no se anima. No, pero está bien, está bien. Yo bueno, que... este, la, eh, nuevamente este, agradecerte a ti, Jesús. Ya estamos en las finales de este extraordinario curso, en verdad. Eh, el doctor Calvo, hoy, hoy es el aniversario de Cayetano, cumple 60 años, así que hay una ceremonia central. Felicitaciones ¿no? a la universidad. Sí, sí, conversé con el doctor Castañeda, el rector de nuestra universidad, médico vascular de nuestro hospital, que le manda muchos saludos y les agradece. El director, el doctor Quispe, como te comenté, está en Estados Unidos y eh, me dijo, me da mucha pena no haber estado, pero... Eh, le hace presente mi saludo al doctor Yuhani, al doctor Santisteva, nuestro agradecimiento, porque, y, y pedirte por tu intermedio al doctor Yuhani, nosotros tenemos un canal de YouTube, como tú sabes, este curso ha sido gratuito, gracias a la gentileza de ustedes, ¿no? Y de la universidad que nos ha dado el acceso al Zoom. Entonces, 
queremos colgar las tres clases en nuestro canal de YouTube, que es de libre acceso, es gratis, ¿no? Para que la gente lo vuelva a ver, a leer, a revisar esas imágenes extraordinarias que nos han mostrado. Reiterándote, Jesús, mi agradecimiento. Eh, este, ojalá que no sea la, la primera ni la, ni la única, yo sé, conociéndote eh, y tu, tu amor y cariño a tu tierra, que no, nunca lo has dejado, eh, siempre estás al día, ¿no? Eh, comentar al, al, al auditorio que como buen inter, internista la usanza de los maestros antiguos, ¿no? Sergio Bernal, nosotros tuvimos al doctor Carcelén, el doctor este, Santisteban es además de políglota, es un hombre que sabe todo, ¿no? Podemos, podemos hablar de historia, de fútbol, de comida, etc. Eh, de repente más adelante invitarte con el cuerpo médico para que nos des alguna charla sobre... Hay otras cosas que los médicos podemos hablar, ¿no? De historia, ¿no? De música. Eh, yo recuerdo en Cayetano, por eso es que me enamoré de Cayetano y estoy hace 20 años, ¿no? Yo no conocía ni la puerta de Cayetano, pero cuando empecé a ir al cuerpo médico, conocía a médicos de gran valía, como el doctor Ciesa, hoy delicado de salud, un gran maestro de, internista, nefrólogo, uno de los primeros que hizo diálisis en Cayetano y en el Perú, el doctor este, Carcelén, con quien discutíamos las radiografías, hasta último, de 92 años, el doctor iba a, la, a las discusiones clínicas, ¿no? el doctor Lucho Pro, ¿no? con el que conversamos de historia y hablábamos algo de quechua, porque él sabe, yo soy quechua hablante, como tú sabes muy bien. Entonces, muy bien. Jesús, mi aprecio de siempre, mi agradecimiento al doctor Yuhani, muchísimas gracias por estas charlas. ¿no? Como diría el doctor Hermino Hernández, que es otro maestro de pediatría de Cayetano, a la usanza antigua y gratis. Sí. Porque ahora todos los cursos cuestan, ¿no? A la usanza antigua y un curso gratis, ¿no? Te agradecemos muchísimo, hemos cumplido todos los objetivos y por favor, eh, si le puedes traducir eso al doctor Yuhani. Sí, yo le voy a decir después de la esto, yo le voy a dar la, la síntesis general de todo tu aprecio o de vuestro aprecio. Tan eh, y lo he visto se la ocurre retórica y quita sino le ocurre anniversary. This was my present for your university. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yuhani. Thank you very much. Excellent uh, lectures, uh, topics and tips, imagine, uh, movies. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Muy bien, Cecita. ¿no? A toda la universidad, mi, mi aprecio. No soy, no soy de Cayetano, pero tengo tantos mi cuñado es de Cayetano, mi primo hermano de Cayetano, o sea, mucha gente de Cayetano en la familia, y, y mi aprecio a todos ustedes, sigan con esa línea de innovación, de, de, de ciencia que siempre Cayetano ha tenido como, como filosofía de educación. Y bueno, un, un abrazo a todos ustedes, y gracias por, por participar de este, de este evento. Necesitan un gran abrazo, estamos ya comunicándonos después por, por el WhatsApp. Perfecto, un fuerte abrazo, estimado amigo. Nos vemos. Nos vemos. Chao. Muchas Chao. gracias. Thank you very much. Chao. Thank you very much. Y por ir para. Eh, bye. Carlos.